There. So we'd like to respectfully acknowledge that our work today is done on unsurrendered and unceded ancestral Willowstick Way lands as established in a series of peace and friendship treaties in 1725. Uh, we fully recognize the nationhood, titles, and sovereignty of all members of the Wabanaki Confederacy, including the Wallistic Way, Mi'kmaq, uh, Pesco, Tomaquati, uh, Abenaki, and Penobscot people, and strive to honor their treaties that were established to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Um, it's important to recognize as we work together to decolonize our thoughts and practices. Uh, that the land upon which we live and work uh, nurtures and protects us, our families, our friends, uh, as well as the colleagues and students uh, connected to us. This is very, um, <laughs> just in, on, the, on the note that we have all of these close um, uh, connections to the center here, I think that that is very relevant. Uh, we encourage everyone to dedicate themselves today and every day to the critical task of truth and re reconciliation as we move and learn forward together. Thank you very much for your patience, everyone. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Lucia Klenkakova. Uh, she is a doctoral student of social work and sociology at Queen's University in Belfast. And she is the, um, the uh, visiting or Eaton visiting scholar uh, that will be spending uh, springtime with us uh, over the next couple months. Lucia is really looking forward to summer. So we had to tell her, you have to wait a couple more weeks, Lucia. <laughs> Um, just a quick um, uh, um, housekeeping note to note that um, I have given you, I have given everyone the opportunity to uh, talk basically. Um, so um, Lucia will have a few questions and uh, prompts to get some conversation. So you can either participate uh, by using the chat feature or unmuting yourself uh, to uh, speak in the microphone. So Lucia, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, MMFC, for scheduling and organizing this beautiful event. Uh, I will talk to you today, obviously, about my research a little bit. But some of these uh, questions that I want to ask you is just to uh, get a little bit of a conversation, since this is a uh, technology platform and I do enjoy a little bit of interaction. They're going to be fun questions. So um, just to ease that topic a little bit. I will also talk to you a little bit about my personal journey, why I came here and I have some collaborative opportunities as well that you might be interested in. So I arrived here uh, in March 2022. So I've been here for about two, three weeks now. Um, and I obviously came to the Eaton Fellowship as a research exchange here at UNB. And this is my first time in Canada. So I also want to travel this summer. And that's why I was saying that I was looking forward to this <laughs> summer because it's been a little bit cold. Um, but since 2018, I was in Northern Ireland at Queen's University of Belfast and I was doing my uh, PhD study which focuses on intimate partner violence among young people and the response of the education sector. So just to introduce uh, my research, um, uh, we all probably know that domestic and intimate partner violence is a major social and human rights issue. And I included some of the prevalence rates as well, just to demonstrate the severity of this issue. And some research suggests as well that it's most active between young people between the ages of 13 to 19 with peak ages of perpetration around 16 to 17, possibly because young people are entering more serious relationship about that age, around that age. Um, but why I included uh, education as an intersection of my research, uh, you will find out that it was uh, quite a significant aspect in my own journey, but I will also shortly uh, uh, point out to the research gap and that the impact of IPV on education can be detrimental and long term, but education has also been uh, highlighted as one of the most protective, important protective factors and empowerment tools in overcoming any trauma or adversity associated with this type of experience. And as some of you may know as well, education sector is the optimal setting to tackle IPV among young people, particularly in prevention and its ability to reach large crowds of people. So the first thing I did in my PhD was to conduct a systematic review of literature where I focused on consequences of IPV on young people's educational well-being. Um, 
initially I included a sample of young women um, and I also included on the slide the publication that was uh, published last year in 2021 in trauma violence and abuse and this is open access publication so please go ahead and, and read it if you're interested in this. Um, Upon examining some of these results as well, I noticed that actually young boys uh, showed almost identical outcomes. And so in my thesis, I include the sample both of young people, of young girls and young boys as well. Um, and just to highlight that gap that I was referring to earlier, out of 4,003 records that were found uh, searching, obviously, uh, different databases, uh, which you can read in the publication, only 47 articles were found to be eligible, but only 10 studies met the criteria and the criteria being um, impact of IPV on education and young people 10 to 24 um, um, and the impact of IPV on education and this is the gap so uh, obviously I have to acknowledge that the major limitation is that we don't have enough research in this area. Uh, nevertheless, the results showed that seven out of 10 uh, articles um, highlighted failing grades and negative impact on GPA. Also common was truancy, lateness and dropout of young people, and then decline in aspirations such as attending college or even finishing high school. And the long term uh, consequences that I wanted to point to was uh, decline in years obtained. So uh, adolescent victims of IPV uh, on average uh, obtained two years less of education, which ultimately also impacted on their economic prosperity or income. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask, um, just to ease into the second part of the study, was if you knew anything about Northern Ireland, because obviously the study is based in Northern Ireland, so I was interested what people knew about the country. And you're free to either put your mic on or you can comment in the comment section as well. Lucia, it's Rod McKendrick from Saskatchewan. Um, I'm the IP, IPV specialist and look after the child abuse uh, protocols and children exposed to violence programs. Um, I was there in the 1969 through to 73 um, and came to Canada uh, 40 years ago, but have some knowledge, quite a bit of knowledge of Northern Ireland and especially around Belfast and Derry. Thank you. Just following up on some comments that uh, in the chat, um, Shelley says she's been to Northern Ireland three times. Uh, nice. Norma thinks it's, it looks fascinating. And Kathy says she has, associates uh, Northern Ireland with a long history of civil unrest and political violence. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So yes, this is a capital uh, Belfast, obviously, on this picture. And uh, um, I've lived there for obviously multiple years. And one important thing to mention in relation to IPV exactly is that it is a post-conflict society. And it has been mentioned that obviously a major concern is conflict recurrence. But sometimes what that does to domestic violence is that it is highly stigmatized and it can become a hidden issue as well. So a lot of the times we would see the domestic or family violence has been handled behind closed doors, um, but it's also sometimes hidden due to paramilitary activity. Just in terms of the reported rates, currently there is 32,000 children and young people living with DV, and of course we know that the reported rates are a um, very small chunk of what is actually happening. Um, in 2019, there were 16,000 IPV crimes in Northern Ireland, but during COVID, um, we've seen a 15% increase, um, and this has been reaching an all-time high, almost 19,000 crimes um, or cases and 32,000 incidents of domestic violence. And even during the, uh, whenever the lockdown started in March 2020, uh, it lasted for 19 weeks. During these 19 weeks, the police service of Northern Ireland re recorded 4,000 abuse related calls. Um, so that's just to give you a background of um, the statistics. And so moving on to the second part of the PhD. Um, so the initial idea of the PhD was to explore obviously the IPV and its impact on educational well-being, but since I saw that global literature is pointing to the fact that the outcomes are quite negative, I saw an opportunity to explore it from a perspective of the education sector and look at what the education sector actually does in order to address IPV among young people in Northern Ireland. 
Um, and since this is an exploratory study, it followed qualitative design. Um, I conducted 15 uh, interviews and focus groups with 25 experts from statutory and voluntary services. Um, and I, I, I analyzed the data thematically using an vivo program. I'm just going to uh, go over the results briefly. Um, I wanted to sort of draw a comparison between formal and non-formal education. And when I speak to formal education, I mean colleges, schools, and higher education. Um, so their response in identifying, reporting, and signposting the cases was quite reactive. And even a lot of the participants um, referred to, to the response as reactive. Trial and error, uh, first disclosure had to happen. So a young person went and sought help. Um, and after that, the, the response happened. So um, it was usually put the responsibility to identify IPV was put on young people. Um, and this is obviously a major issue for help seeking. Um, this was actually quite obvious as well in the uh, CPD, so continuous professional development or training. Um, the training was sort of informative. It was uh, awareness raising session, but only after an issue has been highlighted. So for example, one of the mentions were uh, increase in domestic violence during COVID, um, but the awareness training uh, session didn't happen until long after after we came out of lockdown, the initial series of lockdowns. Um, and this was actually quite prevalent in collaboration as well, where I've noticed that there was a lack of access to schools. And a lot of the times there were clashing priorities between statutory services and the schools as well. So the response within the formal education has been really quite reactive. And there was a I want to say a lack of preparation, but of course, this is not just to criticize formal education. There were some examples of really wonderful initiatives. Um, they just, uh, they were quite informative in nature. Um, and that means that it's a prescriptive way of identifying IPV. So a lot of times among young people, uh, violence has been denied or it was merged with family violence where young people are seen as part of family unit. Uh, a lot of the times it was referred to as bullying. And obviously this uh, lack of recognition of the issue is again, a major issue for help seeking. Um, if professionals do not recognize this as an issue and a young people cannot recognize this as an issue, then obviously uh, help seeking and, and reporting will is likely not to happen. Um, I've been part of another project uh, with my mentor where we have surveyed over 2000 young people in Northern Ireland to ask them about coercive control, if they knew what the term meant and what it looked like, and only 16%, I think it was 13% of young girls, but overall 16% of young people said that they understood the term and they knew what that meant. Um, so that just shows you that the informative nature of, say, even a relationship sexual education um, has not really been uh, very beneficial, very helpful to, to young people. And that, sorry, that leads me to the uh, other side, which is the non-formal or community education, also alternative education. It's quite popular in Northern Ireland and their response has been a little bit more proactive and um, in that the people in the community education has been have been uh, focused on, on trust and, and relationship building with young people, but also other agencies. So the networks were quite visible as well and they, they would offer training. So if there was an issue that they felt was relevant, they would create uh, a training and then they would go to other community organization and to statutory services and offer this training um, for, for free, obviously. But one that comes to mind was uh, training on pornography. Uh, that was one that was mentioned to me recently that I, I remember. Um, but they would also provide young people with information of relevant providers. So they would maybe host these evenings where they would invite young people and, and give them information on mental health, substance abuse, healthy relationships, things like that. They even mentioned that it was important that young people would know ahead of time before it is even needed um, that there is help available if they needed it. Um, and at that point, obviously disclosure hasn't happened, for example. Um, skill building component again in community education was very important in one of the quotes uh, the community educator was saying that they would uh, get young people together in groups to discuss a topic and they would want to have young people leave 
and, and having the skills to recognize abusive tendencies, what it meant to them to be in an abusive relationship and, and in, in turn what they would appreciate if they had in their healthy relationships. So it was mostly giving the skills to young people that are applicable in their real life. And even during COVID, they have approached this very proactively and then they would create these platforms or, or hubs for young people where young people could still come together and discuss these issues and in real time the community educators would be asking them questions to ask have you understood this and making sure that young people left with with the skills to to recognize and and have the skills also to go and seek help or have the information to go and seek help um, and during COVID as well they have noticed that a lot of young people from rural areas participated as well um, what was interesting uh, was the confusion that I have noticed among uh, some of the participants um, around who should be responsible to, to tackle IPV. And this is a slide from, uh, as an example, where participants were discussing schools and their responsibility to tackle this. Um, so here in the corner, you will see non-formal or community educators saying uh, schools are a significant part of young people's lives. It is a prime setting to tackle IPV and they should be providing prevention and then the, the early intervention as well that it is their responsibility. On the other hand, here in the corner, you will see uh, other voluntary organizations or community organizations that are saying that schools are being scapegoated and that teachers should be teaching, they shouldn't be responsible for uh, tackling uh, any issues outside of obviously the educating and curriculum. And, and then the government right here at the top is saying that actually it's not teachers who are responsible for this, but instead this is the designated personnel or safeguarding personnel, but then unfortunately they go through burnouts and they don't stay terribly long in these roles um, because they have a lot on their shoulders. Um, and in fact, this was pointed out to me as well, that it should be just the key personnel. It should be a whole school approach. Um, and then in the corner right here, the formal education would then say, yes, we are in an ideal position in formal education to do this, but we also need the resources and we need to be supported within the wider community. Um, so some of the early recommendations of mine would be, uh, we always talk about joined up and multidisciplinary, multi-agency approach, but also to clarify roles and responsibilities um, because there seems to be, again, quite a lot of confusion. And this was something that participants called for as well. They wanted to clarify their roles and responsibilities and they wanted that joined up approach, the whole school, whole community approach. Um, the other recommendation of, of mine would be to align practice and policy as well. Uh, a lot of the times I've seen that policies were quite vague, they weren't really guiding um, um, the strategies were, were quite vague and they weren't really guiding providers so they weren't really participants didn't really know how to relate to those. Um, right. So I don't know if you have any questions at this point as well. Uh, obviously feel free to ask at any point of, um, of these presentations as well. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, me. Um, this is a picture of where I was born. Uh, this is in Slovakia. It's called Tatra Mountains. I don't know if you've ever been, um, but that is where I mentioned that education uh, played a significant role in, in my own uh, personal development and my professional development as well. And I, if you wish to share, obviously I wanted to ask if there has been anything for you that has also played a major role in, in your professional or personal life. Um, so I don't know if you wanna share uh, either in chat or if you wanna talk to me, if you wanna ask me any questions before I move forward. I can comment, Lucia. This is Denny. Yes. Um, for me, uh, education has been a, um, uh, as a, I'm a graduate student myself, um, and uh, being involved in this sector and in this type of education um, has really, um, I've, desc I've described it from, to other people as being almost a bit of, of a jarring experience in terms of being able to really see the full, the wider breadth of things and being able to full, fully understand what exactly is violence and how 
uh, per, um, pervasive as it is and how far and wide it can stretch. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. I'm just going to move on then. Um, so, so I wanted to mention a little bit about why I selected this topic, obviously. So I come from uh, generations of domestic violence, um, and I also went through some toxic friendships and relationships as a young person. Um, that's why I selected this, this topic. But I suppose education has played a, a major role in my life uh, when I went to college in my early 20s. I went to Manchester Metropolitan University and I took some gender studies classes and I started understanding inequality, um, not just gender inequality, but in broader sense inequality and motivations uh, that reflect in our own behavior. And then I became drawn to psychology of language where I explored the relationships among young people and relational inequality, but also got to experience a little bit of education and its impact on violence. And I, I looked at some of the aspects of, of war violence and cultural violence. And this led me to, to pursuing my PhD. So this was also for my own personal benefit where um, through the PhD and through my own personal journey, I found my mission, which was to help uh, families and children and young people in particular that are faced with this type of adversity and I I suppose that was the reason why I wanted to come here to UNB and specifically MMFC because I've seen the the diversity and the creativity um, and the the different approaches and people from various backgrounds that were approaching this issue from very different perspectives and I wanted to learn and be inspired by them as well um, but of course I, I came here with the vision of a professional development as well uh, first thing that I would like to highlight was the conference so I originally came here to attend Canadian uh, domestic violence conference but unfortunately as I found out it was postponed and I should not no longer me in the country by then um, so please if you do have any suggestions on other conferences or events that you feel uh, would benefit from maybe my input um, I should be here in Canada until the end of summer so um, September is when I'm leaving and I will sort of be traveling across the country so I could participate in other events as well uh, in different parts of Canada and a publication article and workshop is something that I wanted to talk to you about in terms of maybe collaboration opportunities uh, that you may be interested in. So the first thing would be publication. Um, the timeline is quite a short because obviously I do have only a certain amount of time to put this together, but I would like to collaborate on a publication between say April to, to June, like late June, early July is when I would like to be submitting. And the idea behind the publication would be to do a similar comparison between formal and community education. And I would welcome any contribution around relationship sexual education uh, or Canadian education system, um, participatory education methods but of course it could be something around frontline response as well to intimate partner violence any types of collaboration strategies training or policies so if you do have expertise in that area and would like to contribute then we could have a, a conversation around that I also highly encourage other perspectives there is not really enough research around um, LGBTQI plus um, ethnic and racial groups other than Caucasian and then of course uh, people uh, in foster care or care young people in care uh, people with disabilities um, so I would highly also encourage you to get in touch if you want to contribute to this um, and of course we can have a discussion around how much you would like to contribute as well so uh, do not be discouraged uh, about that so that's one uh, possibility. The other one is a online platform. Uh, so this pl platform is our Queen's University of Belfast policy engagement. And I included a link here in case you would like to go and maybe have a look at, at how it works. And this would be sort of like an article. Um, I think it's up to 2000 words ish. Um, and they include different themes. Uh, so these themes could be around children, youth, it could be media, education, equality, health and well-being. Um, the article idea here could be evaluation of policy and practice, but it could also be European and Canadian perspective of policies and our engagement. The other thing that I was thinking about would be uh, taking a definition, a policy definition, and maybe um, 
arguing around how it maybe applies to um, a practice. So these are different types of ideas that were sort of going to my head. And so if you maybe see yourself in that uh, kind of collaboration, please also get in touch with me and I will share my details in a minute. And then finally, we're thinking of doing a workshop. And uh, Danny, I hope that we do have that poll that we wanted to release. Uh, yes. Thank you. So we are going to release a poll and we would love to hear your opinion. Yes, that's perfect. Um, we would love to hear your opinion if you would like to potentially participate. And so the idea behind these workshop would be that, that this would be sort of like a brainstorming sessions where we would get all sorts of people together. Um, one possible topic that we were hoping to maybe discuss would be COVID-19 and uh, some of the response or obstacles around that. We do have currently some, some data, but of course we will be doing, or I will be doing more research around that as well, not just in terms of existing literature but also some government documentation that is available um, to maybe brainstorm some of the possible solutions to obstacles that um, maybe frontline workers have experienced during COVID. The other topic that we are thinking about was to look at solutions or how to involve young people more in IPV prevention. Um, sometimes maybe and I have seen this in my own project where young people felt that prevention was not really relevant. Uh, like I said, it was information driven. It wasn't really um, giving them any skills. It was very repetitive for them as well. Um, so we would like to look at possible solutions of how to make it more engaging, more interactive, more relevant for young people. Um, the other topic that we were thinking about would be to look at specific collaborations around skill building. So. Um, if there are any skill building trainings or, or uh, possible other workshops or, or things that are being conducted at the moment, we could be looking at some of the collaborations of how to make this maybe a little bit again more relevant or how we could contribute to this as well. So it's more seeking a solution and having that brainstorming sessions around skill building interventions or something like that. And then the last uh, topic would be um, aligning policy and practice. So again, brainstorming different solutions. One of the things that I was thinking about was when I read a recent Northern Irish proposal for, um, for policy or strategy to prevent violence against girls and women. Um, and they were saying that they would like to achieve that all girls are safe in the community. So the idea behind this would be taking a specific example and then maybe be finding a solutions of what this looks like in real life, um, what this looks like in practice, and how we can align the idea, how can we measure it, monitor it, things like that. Um, so I hope this makes sense, um, but we would love to hear your feedback if, if you would be potentially interested in maybe attending, or if this would be something that um, you would find or you would welcome. Um, yes. So here are my uh, details if you wish to get in touch with me. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for listening and again for being here as well and engaging in the conversation. Um, and yeah, I would like to give you an opportunity if you wish to ask any questions, that'd be awesome. Or if you would like to share anything. <laughs>